Greetings, YouTube. Um, last weekend, I was attempting to go to a estate sale, an estate sale, in Ware, New Hampshire. That's W-E-A-R-E, -E, not W-H-E-R-E, -E, though that would be very appropriate. Um, and to get there, you have to drive on 114. There isn't really any option. So I get to, like, what passes for downtown Ware. It's a very small place. And there's a road race. Now, there was no signs. Um, apparently, the uh, uh, estate sale itself was unaware that there was a road race because when I talk, spoke to them um, later, they are like, well, that might explain why people uh, have been kind of kind of light today. But there was a cop there, and the cop just stood there. Didn't say anything to anybody. We're just backing up. I was fourth car back, I think, and there was five or six behind me. And eventually I turned my ass around and did a three-point turn and went back the way I came. Um, and I found a detour, and I took the detour, but eventually I hit 114 again. And there was still a road race. But this time there was a cop, and again, no signage, no warnings, no nothing. And this cop seemed to understand that if she didn't let cars through, no one was getting anywhere. So when there were brakes in the, the runners and the walkers, it was not a high-speed road race, uh, she was able to get two or three cars at a time. And eventually I was able to get through. But this whole process made me really angry. It enraged me. Jaw-clenching, seething rage. And I be, tried to distract myself, and I succeeded listening to NPR, and I think I was working on some gaming ideas in my head or something. And eventually I calmed myself down. So once I was in a calm state, I began to try to piece apart why I was so goddamn angry. Because when you're caught in that, you're not going to be able to get anything useful out of it. You can't fix an engine when it's running. Um... At least you can't take it apart. That's what I had to do here. I had to take this thing apart and try to figure out what the hell was going on. And as I began to kind of say, okay, why is this? What, 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 what was leading to what and the kind of thing? I realized that what had really gotten to me was that, in essence, we the drivers, the primary users of roads, and I, I, I know that that's a loaded statement, but the reality is, is that roads are made for cars. The primary users of the roads had not been taken into consideration for this road race. We had not been informed. We were not, there was no signage, there was no announcements, there was no nothing. I know that in my town, when we have a race coming up, they put signs up like two weeks out to warn everybody. And those signs are up there until the road race is done. Back, apparently, sometimes those signs are up there after the road race is over. Because apparently they're a little slow in the uptake. But at least they're out there before the race. And in this little rinky-dink town, um, it was amateur hour. So I began to realize, okay, they didn't they didn't consider you know the, the primary users of the road. Why? And, and that, then I realized that we had not been considered important enough. To concern themselves with. We had been an afterthought. We were simply not important. And that's that's pretty much when I started to cry. Because that's what had made me so damn angry. It wasn't the road race. It wasn't the amateur hour in Ware, New Hampshire. It wasn't having to drive on a 114 whether I wanted to or not. It was the realization that I had not been considered to be important in my childhood. Now, my parents got married because that's what you did. Society and their families expected them to get married. Not necessarily them, but to get married. You got married when you got to a certain stage in life. And so that's what they did. And once you got married, you had children. 
And so they did that. And so society said, these are the things you do. And I think my parents went along with that narrative. Maybe they even bought into that narrative. But they were engaged with the narrative, not with the actual real-world ramifications of a marriage and a child. And a marriage is work, neither of which of them which were suited to this task, one of whom was a screaming, psychotic alcoholic, and the other who was a passive-aggressive enabler, having been raised that way by her mother. So neither of them had broken out of the patterns they had been given as children. My father was raised by an alcoholic, abusive alcoholic. He became an abusive alcoholic. He raised his children as an abusive alcoholic. He was married as an abusive alcoholic. Um, and of course, along I came. I was the first grandchild on either side of the family, so oh yay, grandkid! So they were given the accolades for having succeeded at this societal and familial narrative. But there are ramifications to a child being born into the world. And neither, neither of my parents was suited to be a parent. Neither of them should have been parents. Not the first time and not the second time when my sister was introduced to the world. They were just not suited to this task. They were completely unqualified. They had no inkling of what to do. Um, arguably, they did less bad with my sister. I can't say they did good, but they did less bad. But in both cases, they just sucked at their job. And while they were involved in the narrative of being a parent, they didn't know fuck all about being parents. And my needs and desires and a healthy environment that would let me grow up to be a healthy adult were never considered at all. Those weren't things that they ever even thought about. It wasn't considered important. It wasn't considered something that, that was worth their time. I wasn't worth their time. I was unworthy. So, as you can imagine, having pieced that whole 114 where New Hampshire road race thing apart and gotten to the crux of it, which was the whole importance, worth, uh, and kernel in this whole mess. I have a different perspective on it now at 54, fastly, quickly approaching uh, 55, than I had when I was, say, 14 and began to realize just how fucked up my family was. Uh, having been actively suicidal, beginning at age 12, I began to realize that maybe things were rotten in Denmark. And it wasn't just me. Um, I really began to kick in at 15, and I began to spend a whole lot of my time desperately trying not to be Ed. And not, desperately not trying to be Ed kept me going for a long time. Um, it took me a very long time to realize how to begin to be James. So... The reality is, is I do have import. I possess worth. It's intrinsic to being a human being. I am worthy of love, affection, of consideration, of friendship. And anyone who thinks otherwise, well, there's a, they can take a long walk off a short pier. I've got no need for them in my life. I don't have a lot of friends in the real world. The ones I do have are scattered to the four winds. I very rarely see when I see them. Um, my wife is one of my best friends, is my best friend. Uh, my friend Felicia, uh, ancillarily, her boyfriend occasionally. Uh, most of the people I spend a lot of time talking to are here, here on the internets. Um, two of the people I care deeply about, my friends Amelia and Amy, yes, they both have names that begin with AM, 
um, are people that I've never met. And it's very likely that I may never, ever meet them. And that's okay. But they're here. They're in my life. And I love them. And they're very important to me. It doesn't matter that I haven't met them. I have my wife. I have Felicia. I have a few other friends I care about. And that's what matters. And in their eyes, I have worth and import. And at the end of the day, that's all that really matters. Now, I'm not saying that this particular positive state of mind will last forever. Um, it'll come and go. But I'm better at remembering these things now. They don't slip away and cease to exist as soon as I stop thinking about them. They used to do that. And I'd have to relearn it all over again and again and again. Because that was my anxiety and my depression getting in the way of me healing, of growing, of becoming better. But I've gotten better at handling those things. I've gotten better at seeing around their bullshit. Um, better at learning their tricks. And yes, there are times when I very much have an adversarial relationship with my anxiety and my depression. I realize that isn't very Buddhist-like, but you know, you work with what you got. So, I'm happy I got here. It was a long, strange trip. Um, it was a nice little estate sale. Horrible driveway. It was like a 30 degree de uh, incline going down, and then they went into like a 45 degree incline after a 90 degree turn. Getting back up, that sucked. I had to walk the entire way. But, uh, lovely lakeside property. Really quite beautiful. And oddly, this giant stein, I couldn't get a picture of it until they put their uh, telescope in front of it so they wanted to buy it. But it was like literally like a four-foot stein. It was like they were selling for six grand. I don't have any idea who wants to buy a $6,000 four-foot stein, but I'm, I'm sure that somebody did. Um, I hate to have to ship it, at least. So, at the end of the day, it was successful. I had some fun out there bargain hunting. I uh, got some mall Chinese food just for fun, and uh, I learned a little. So it wasn't a bad day. My therapist is happy. I sent him an email about this. My wife's happy. I sent her an email about this. She wasn't home at the time. And I'm doing a video here to tell everybody else. So don't give up on yourself. You're important. You have worth. And you are worthy.